Family court lawyers, what's the most petty behavior you've seen from parents? Story 1. I may have written about this before. For my first job as an attorney, I clerked for a state court of appeals. An appellate court reviews all manner of lower court decisions, including family law. Every single case that was sent to our court came with a case file. That included all the actions that the trial court took into the course of a trial, a transcript of all court proceedings and briefs by all concerned parties. And most often, you could immediately know what kind of case you were handling, simply by the size slash thickness of that case file. Usually criminal cases had the thinnest files, two to three inches thick, a day or two of trial transcript, short briefs by the defendant and the state, and approximately 10 to 15 motions. Civil cases were a little thicker, because the frequent use of expert testimony made the trial and transcripts longer, and the lack of a constitutional right to speedy trial in civil cases allowed many attorneys to use procedural law and motions in a corrosive manner, so there is a lot of paperwork. Read Rainmaker. Usually the party's briefs included a few more issues than you'd find in a criminal case. Altogether, five to six inches thick. This was a death penalty state, and we did have many such cases. These were serious felonies, and trials took a couple of weeks, so very thick transcripts. Many required constitutional steps and required a separate trial for sentencing. These case files were maybe 12 to 15 inches thick. Then there were the divorce cases. Appeals are not mandated in divorce cases. So my court only saw those divorce cases where the fighting between the ex-spouses couldn't be resolved satisfactorily by the divorce court. In other words, at least one ex wanted another opinion slash chance at winning. These case files took up drawers. These case files were measured in feet, not inches. The largest files were those where children were involved. In other words, these people wouldn't co-parent and so had to run back to the trial court for nearly every single disagreement, where and how to school, feed, clothe, practice religion, conduct extracurricular activities, etc. Repeatedly renegotiate negotiating child support, repeatedly trying to change custody or visitation orders, trying to control how the other parent managed his or her time with a child. And every single one of these court proceedings cost money. Lots of money. I handled one case where the father didn't want the mother to give the child multivitamins. Hundreds of dollars in attorney fees over a Flintstone chewable. These fights were really rarely about the kids. They were attempts to control the ex-spouse through the kids. And what these litigants never realized is that by refusing to co-parent, they essentially were giving over their parental role to the judge. In their efforts to control one another, they lost all power and control. Imagine blowing all your money on a court hearing for a Flintstone gummy. Like, come on, those things are delicious. Don't take that away from your own kid. On a more serious note, though, they're already putting their kids and themselves too through the whole divorce process. I'll never understand why some people can't just agree to separate smoothly and not make such a fuss in court. Also, I just learned so much about case files. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Story 2. In law school, I did some intern work for a family law clinic. Most of my clients were pretty reasonable. But when waiting for my cases to be heard in the hearing room, I saw some really petty and terrible stuff from other parties. But one case stood out as the worst. One guy who got custody of the family dog in divorce said that if he didn't get more visitation with the children, he would have the dog euthanized. His excuse was that without the kids there, the dog wouldn't get the attention it needed and was better off dead. The ex-wife made an impassioned plea before the judge, showing pictures of the kids playing with the dog and video testimony from the kids expressing their love for it. It was 100% clear they would be devastated if the dog was put down. Well, the judge was very sympathetic and tried asking the ex-husband to be reasonable, in the end, her hands were tied. Since the dog was the ex-husband's property, per the divorce agreement, and he was free to do whatever he wanted, provided it comported with the state anti-cruelty laws. In the end, she relented to give custody rights basically every weekend of the month in order to save the kid's dog. To the judge's credit, she gave the ex-husband a verbal haranguing like I've never seen in all my years of practicing law since. She warned him that she would be watching this case very closely and would not hesitate referring it to a criminal prosecution if he slips up in any way, either towards the treatment of the dog or the kids. And that if anything happens to that dog, she would fast-track a hearing to revisit his visitation rights, and strongly implied the new visitation schedule would be vastly against his favor should that come to pass. On that day, I realized I never wanted to be a family lawyer. The interim court order said that my client, the mom, was not to discuss the court procedures with the child. During an access visit, the child asked her, When will I get to see you again? And my client responded, We'll have to see, but hopefully soon. The father then argued that this was discussing the court proceedings with the child, and tried using it as an excuse to deny any further access. What a scumbag, the two of them. I'm at a loss for words. How do you threaten your own children's dog? Like you're willing to take an innocent life if you didn't get what you wanted? What an absolutely disgusting human being. Props to the judge for everything she said, though. She had a lot more restraint than I would have. Story 3. The worst I was ever a part of. In California, we have certain requirements to meet before one parent can move away with the child. These requirements kick in when the other parent's visitation will be materially impacted by the move. My client is a mom. She is a dental hygienist. She has kids with Dentist 1 and divorces dad for Dentist 2. She wants to move with the kids to Dentist 2's house so she can work with him, live closer to work, etc. 
Dentist 2's town is a 25-minute drive away from Dentist 1's town. Between the two of them, the two dentists must have spent nearly 400k fighting over a 25-minute move. This was also the moment I realized I made a terrible mistake becoming a lawyer when I should have become a dentist. Bonus, saddest behavior I have personally seen. Mom creating fake spicy abuse stories and dropping hints to the pediatrician. In turn causing the pediatrician to call PS about dad. All worked out in the end. Mom lost custody because of her actions after it all came out. Double bonus, funniest thing I ever saw. Rich, breadwinning wife refused to pay husband spousal support because those laws were written to protect housewives. He's not a housewife. This is insane. Man, maybe I gotta become a dentist. But seriously? That second mom should have to serve some kind of time after making those stories up. Those can destroy lives so easily. What a scumbag. Like, what was she trying to gain from that? And that double bonus one? She doesn't actually think those laws are only for housewives, right? Right? Story 4. I practice law. Not usually family law, but I have a case of my own right now. My grade school age son took an entrance exam for a gifted student program. He's been offered a spot in the program, but it will require switching to a different school. Within the district, next year if he joins. The program is very well regarded in town. One person whose kids went through it described it to me as a quality private school education for free. I have to go to court in a few weeks to argue over whether our son should join the program. His mother, who signed it up for the test and called it the most important day of his life, has now decided he shouldn't join it. I don't know why. She made some half-hearted arguments that he couldn't handle it and that she'd have to do too much driving. But I suspect it's just because I'm in favor of it. This is really getting me down. It's a great opportunity for our son and she just doesn't want to agree. Wow, your wife sounds pleasant. She signed him up for it, but now it'll be too much driving, etc. Definitely sounds like she was hoping you'd be against it and just wanted to tick you off. But now seeing you're for it just wants to be difficult. I can't stand people who just want everything to be a problem. Story 5 I have been in family law for over a decade, and the most petty thing I have ever seen happen was that the wife from an affluent divorcing family had several trees planted on one side of a fence on the property, and the husband wanted them planted on the other side of the exact same fence, about 5 feet from where the wife had them planted. He insisted that we file contempt against the wife for said tree plantings. They spent close to $50,000 in legal fees arguing over the stupid trees. It was incredulous. I have stories upon stories of people's pettiness, but this one will always stand out for me. Another really petty one was my dad buying a money order for his child support every month, but not actually giving them to the mom. He gave us copies of all the money orders he bought as evidence of the support he paid, but she claimed she had never received them. Well, that seems stupid, but no, he had actually just kept them. And then, like an idiot, gave the original months old money order to the mom to be paid for the outstanding child support balance. He was definitely found in contempt. People can be really ridiculous. No way he actually did that. What an idiot. So glad he got caught and the mom got the money. It really amazes me how stupid people can be when trying to cheat the system. They always think they'll get away with it. Makes it that much better when they finally get caught. Story 6. I'm just an intern. But once I was sifting through discovery that our client provided, as he was trying to win custody over his son, one of these pieces of discovery was a detailed account of the mother's timeliness. Basically, if the mother was late to pick up her son, they would time it and document it, which would make sense if it was significant. But I'm not exaggerating. Over a six-month period, she was late a total of 33 minutes. Seeing as they meant to exchange the child three times a week, it means she was late by about one or two minutes once a week. It was the most insignificant piece of data that I've ever seen in my entire life. But the client was adamant that we used it in court to prove that the mother was irresponsible. Story 7. Father wanted full custody of his child. Child was in full mother's custody. Child has diabetes. Both parents must fill a daily glucose intake, measured by a glucometer. Every time father dropped the child off at mom's, he would buy a Snickers or Twix on the way there and feed it to the kid. Then we flipped out the glucose measurements during court. Due to the measurements being extremely high when the child was at the mom's, we were able to get the child to the father's full custody. I didn't know what he was doing. I certainly didn't advise him to do it. He just brought it to the courthouse and ordered me to present it. Either that or the time where during divorce, a guy had exact knowledge of how many toilet paper sheets his wife was overusing and how many liters of warm water she overused. Imagine poisoning your own child just to get what you want. How despicable. I really hope it was all found out and the kid was returned back to the mother. And how did that other guy know? Like, what does one look for to figure out how much TP and water someone's using? That's next level stalking. Story 8. My girlfriend is a family lawyer. She had a pair from Eastern Europe. We're in Ontario. Who wanted a divorce. Long fight over what the husband's assets were. He claimed to be living on less than $12,000 cash a year. Wife hired a private detective, eventually found out he was hiding in another home, and won a big settlement. My girlfriend is really happy. No, she doesn't get a penny of the settlement or bonus or extra pay. She just likes seeing the liar caught. But the wife still isn't happy. Claims the husband is hiding even more money. Keeps badgering him with more legal stuff, even though my girlfriend is telling her, you won, let it be. Then the husband hires a PI, finds out the wife is a joint owner of another house with her new boyfriend. 
Settlement invalidated. My girlfriend immediately got off the record and refused to help the woman anymore. That woman definitely developed a gambling addiction or something off of that. Gotta know when to fold and just let things be. But I'm also glad she didn't since she was lying too. Good for your girlfriend getting out of there before it went on any further. Story 9 a mother actively coached her two kids to say that dad was physically and spicily abusive to them. She would have gotten away with it except for two things. The court-appointed psych managed to catch these lies out in the interview. To date, longest report I have read at 280 pages. And the oldest kid, then 10 I think, got annoyed at the mother for some such reason. Got annoyed at the mother for some such reason and refundled her on their cell phone, which was promptly played for dad. In the end, dad got full day-to-day -day care, and mother had supervised contact for six months before she went to every second weekend. What kind of horrible person do you have to be to make up a story about someone like that? And to his own kids, no less. Glad karma got her. Kinda wish he got her a little more. Story 10 The ex-husband didn't want to pay what he owed his ex-wife. He thought he could frick her over by dragging on the process with appeals. It was not only hurting her, but also his children. She desperately needed the money, and he knew that. Him dragging the process caused her to lose her job and have to move back with her parents. But once he paid, she not only moved out, but bought a house. No, not just applied for a loan and got a house. Straight out paid cash for a full house. In the end, he not only had to pay the full amount of what he owed, but child support, his lawyer fees, and her lawyer fees. What a moron. His wallet is definitely hurting now, and rightfully so. You don't make your kids suffer like that. I don't care how bitter you are. Story 11. Probably the case where a woman spicily assaulted her toddler daughter. Digital penetration. In the bathroom of a supervised visitation center. I guess her plan was that the child would see her dad and start complaining about the pain? Not very smart though, as I said, it was all supervised. Yes, she lost custody. I hope she went to jail too. Story 12. Family law legal assistant here. A client of ours included a chunk of pork in the freezer and her list of assets that she insisted she get back. The lawyer on the other side came back with, Respectfully, I'm not going to argue over secondhand meat in a freezer. Story 13. Repeatedly taking the kids to CPS and trying to get them to accuse a teenager of spicy assault. Every medical record makes it clear that the mother was the only one doing any talking. What's worse? She was a social worker trained to interview child spicy victims professionally. Story 14. As an intern, I saw a couple have long, hateful emails about who was going to keep a unisex Armani hoodie. Almost all of their discussions centered on that one hoodie. When in the end the husband got to keep it, the wife cut holes into it which ruined it. It was pretty nice to be honest. Story 15 A client once called me with an emergency. The emergency was that the soon-to-be ex-wife fed the kids Chef Boyardee for dinner. I went to law school for this. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe for more videos to come or else this spider will be in your bed tonight.